third. Yeah. Thanks. So the, uh, the third lecture will start with a comment on the second lecture. Uh, at the end of the second lecture, Eric Panzer asked a question about the validity of the formula I wrote on the blackboard. And yes, the formula was wrong. And let me just write the correct version. So if we have a multiple zeta value written in the F alphabet, that is a, a multiple zeta value written as F of I1 to F of IR. And we want the single valued version of it. Then this can be represented as a sum of j equal 0 to r f i1 to f i j f r down to f i j plus 1. And then, most importantly, there will be a shuffle product in here. So this is not a concatenation but the shuffle product is here. So please correct the formula in what you wrote down to make sure that there is no wrong expression in your notes. No, that means that you basically cut the word on the left hand side and you write the whole word in the same way as uh, I, uh, you saw it in the relations for the polylogarithms. So uh, in my notes, I had two words behind that formula. The first one was beautiful, and the second one said, I won't explain why that is true, because the proof of this formula uses a lot of mathematical concepts, which, as Eric said, would require an, a lecture on its own. So the next thing I would like to look at is, again, a little a uh, detour to numerics computer uh, implementation. I would like to talk about uh, PSLQ or the Mathematica way of it, which is called find integer null vector. So who of you tried PSLQ in the meantime, after I send this email? One, two, three, four, OK, five, some, some at least. Uh, so let me define what that actually is about. Uh, first of all, what does PSLQ mean? PS is for partial sum, and LQ is for least squares. So that describes two of the methods used in finding these uh, numerical solutions. Let me write down something like a definition. So let x equal to x1 to xn be a set of rational numbers. Sorry, a set of real numbers. An integer relation is a vector a1 to a n of integers such that the sum i equal 1 to n a i x i equals 0. You can find a nice introduction in a paper by, or in a short paper by Armin Straub. Uh, it's called A Gentle Introduction to PSLQ. Uh, 
and there's also uh, the original papers uh, for this uh, algorithm so that has been developed by Ferguson and Bailey in 92 and there is an article which I can recommend it's by Borwein and Bailey uh, in 03 and it's called Mathematics by Experiment. Uh, and it's a little longer and the next uh, words are plausible reasoning in the 21st century. That is a little too large of a statement, I suppose, but in the context of mathematics by experiment, they actually talk about at which point something uh, can be considered as safe or not safe, and they also discuss uh, how these numerical experiments lead to new insights and how they can actually help, despite the fact that you can't actually prove a lot of things that you understand something in a, a better way. So how does this algorithm work? There's a lot of linear algebra involved. Let me just sketch the basic starting point. So there was already Euclid who looked at two real numbers and was asking the question, um, what is the smallest integer relation between those two? and find a solution to a1, x1 plus b1, uh, sorry, a2, x2 equals zero. And the solution he came up is something which relies on the construction of so-called continued fraction. So a continued fraction, I'm sure, you have seen that before, is an expression of the form A0 plus 1 over A1 plus 1 over A2 plus 1 over and so on and so forth. And the uh, important statement for these continued fractions is that any rational number has a unique representation as a continued fraction and every irrational number has an also unique but infinite representation as a continued fraction. So if the number is rational, obviously, you can express them in a unique way as these continued fractions. If it's irrational, it's still unique, but it's not finite. Now, uh, what is done in this PSLQ formalism? In this PSLQ formalism, uh, the sum, of course, starting from some uh, arbitrary set of integer numbers, AI, is calculated, and a measure is defined of how good this uh, integer relation actually matches zero. And then an operation is defined on a certain matrix which encodes the integer relation, which by proof will improve the representation of the integer relation. So it is a recursive formalism. You start with a vector, which, uh, a vector a1 to an, which points somewhere, and then in each step you actually uh, find a, a vector which is slightly better. And then you have a measure of how good your integer relation is, and if you are below a certain threshold, then you declare it to be an integer relation. So this uh, PSLQ formalism will give you a threshold if it can't actually find an integer relation. And the measurement of how good the uh, algorithm actually is, uh, is measured in the, or can be guessed, uh, 
considering the number of digits for the real numbers given and the number of digits in the integer relation. This is a very rough measure, but the statement is in order to get a relation of length n, with coefficients of length d, that is integers of the order of 10 to the d, you will uh, need real numbers of precision n times d. That is, that's the number of digits you better have for your input numbers and according floating point operation. That is, if your ansatz for a basis of numbers is rather small, then you are in good shape because then your n will be small. So for the example I gave as the small homework problem, there were just four objects at weight 8 in the basis. So we are having n equal 4 and the length d uh, was the is the length of the coefficients, this was 1 over or 2 because I chose some very low prime numbers. It could have been 3 or 4, but even if it is 4 in a certain representation, so for the, if you really take integers, it's 4. We had 4 times 4, 16 digits should have been enough. So I didn't need to send you all those 1,000 digits. 16 would have been enough. Nevertheless, uh, you can because it's multiplicative, very fast get to uh, rather high numbers you need in order to have the thing converge. Now, what is it good for? The first things it has been used for is to prove identities or to show validity, I should be more careful here, show validity of identities which were absolutely out of reach before. For example, and this is something uh, David Broadhurst proved and also showed that he had a very nice implementation. You can prove identities like 1 plus 1 half plus and so on plus 1 over k squared k plus 1 to the minus 4 and this is nothing else as a neat representation of the difference between the two basis elements of multiple zeta values at weight 6. This would, be, would have been rather difficult to guess, I suppose. And there is a plethora of other identities like that. Now, how, what is the reason I'm, I'm telling you about this PSLQ formalism? There have been many people who have been using that formalism and lots of the available formula have been guessed. But what I have been using it for and we have been using it for here is the following example. Suppose you want to invert a matrix which contains linear combinations of Mandelstam variables. So that will occur if you, for example, consider the KLT kernel in the double copy construction and you uh, at some point need to invert a matrix. And let's say your matrix is of the form Sij plus SKL plus and a lot more. And then you will have a large matrix. By large, I mean something like 24 or 120 uh, of these things 
and you want to calculate the inverse of that matrix. The first thing you want to do is you want to better put your Mandelstam variables into a basis. But even if you do so, the expressions might be terribly long and Mathematica will fail inverting this matrix immediately. So already at the 24 by 24 matrix, it is very tough and the algebraic expressions are long and most of the work Mathematica internally does is actually uh, simplifying the expressions accordingly. But there's another way you could actually do that. You could assign each of these uh, SIJs uh, suf sufficiently transcendental uh, numerical value. So in practice, you would just take a random number which is with a sufficient number of digits and then it's very unlikely you get any integer relations between those. And then you plug in this and you get a numerical matrix and the inversion of 120 by 120 numerical matrix, even with a very high precision, which you want to take along, uh, is a piece of cake. So that will take a couple of seconds. And if you go to a larger matrix sizes, it might be uh, a minute if you have very high precision. But yes, it's more or less immediate. So what will you get? You will get something which is 1 over the determinant, let me call the matrix A, times another matrix. And the determinant will uh, be of the, uh, that is something you can also calculate numerically very easily from this matrix. And from the matrix size and the degree of the determinant, you know what kind of terms you will have here. In general, this will be products of Mandelstam variables plus another uh, KL, M, N, uh, R, S, and so on. And you know what the degree uh, is because uh, if you calculate the determinant, uh, the inverse, then you know that it, in total it has to give the unit matrix and you know what the degree in terms of Mandelstam variables for the determinant is. And then you can just numerically create an ansatz by finding a basis for these products of Mandelstam variables using uh, the, the analytic, uh, using momentum conservation. Plug in these numbers and then use PSLQ on each of the uh, entries in the matrix. And in fact, that uh, allowed, that was a project we did with uh, Andre, or I think it was more Andre's project, but the inversion idea came here from here. Uh, that allows the inversion of these matrices easily for high uh, matrix sizes and also complicated expressions here. And this is a general concept. So if some step in the uh, analytic evaluation of, say, a matrix or a certain equation uh, is difficult, and you can map it onto a problem which will result in something which is a linear combination of some objects of a certain basis, you can try to play those games and ease your life enormously. So uh, this is maybe the, uh, an, a very easy example, but there's more complicated calculation setups where you can think about doing that. And I've been playing those games for the last couple of years numerous times, just if I couldn't invert something, if I couldn't get an uh, equation uh, analytically. So um, shall we uh, collect the result for the uh, number I send you? So I think the uh, expression, let me call it x, uh, or this number, was the uh, following. It was 1 over 5 zeta uh, 3.5 plus 1 over 7 zeta of 8 
plus 2 over 13 zeta of 3 and zeta of 5. Very easy expression matching exactly the shape Lance assumed the number would be when we discussed it. So it has a multi zeta in there. It is the lowest weight where you can uh, get the multi zeta and it has some nice prime numbers. Did anybody of you record how many iterations of the PSLQ algorithm you needed in order to find the null vector? That should be of the size four or five because these are prime numbers, they are very small and the convergence of the algorithm is amazing once you have these small uh, numbers without any common divisors. Good. So this is the end of the genus zero part. Let me uh, collect what we had briefly in order also to show what is going to come next. So we had at genus zero, we have been looking at integrals on a Riemann sphere between zero and one that were the uh, usual zeta values. So we always have been considering this integration region here. And we had the uh, zetas in the two different ways of writing them. Zeta with the natural numbers in there or in the alphabet with zero and one, there was stuffle and shuffle, and finally there was the F alphabet representation. And then there was the link to the single valued world with the formula which is still up there, which allowed in a very neat and easy way to get single valued zeta values and the geometrical uh, statement was that now if we get single valued uh, zeta values we don't have to specify the integration path anymore but we can rather choose any in the which is in the same homotopy class which for the Riemann sphere is trivial so we can take any integration path from zero to one because the whole complex plane is just one Riemann sheet. And in the following, I would like to take the step to genus one. And my goal for the end of next lecture is that I can, in the same way, fill uh, a box here and fill a box here. However, I'm not so sure whether I can talk very much about the single valued versions of elliptic multiple zeta values in fact, because of lack of time and also because of lack of knowledge. Uh, because there's many things which are not as safe and as settled as they are in the uh, genus zero case. Now, how can we make a transition from genus zero to genus one? Uh, this is a little the wrong way around because uh, usually one will consider a genus one surface and I will only consider a torus here and think about how you can degenerate this genus one surface into a sphere. I will take the other approach and I want to have two marked points on that sphere. These points I want to call zero and infinity and then I would like to uh, consider these points actually not as points but rather as tiny little circles. There's good arguments for doing so. Uh, one argument might be that string theory advises you to see them as little circles for massless uh, external string modes, but there's also an open, uh, uh, the, the question of whether everything around it is an open set. So for now, let's stick to small circles on the Riemann sphere. And then the uh, transition to genus one will happen if I take these two points and actually put them together. And I can do so in two different ways. The one way is I can take them and squeeze it in the middle. So what will happen? I will get 
uh, an object here. Let me try to draw this, which is of that shape. And it will result in a torus, which I will draw here, where these two small circles have been merged and will result in the hole in the torus. But there's also another possibility. Nobody told me that I need to connect it that way. I could also take these two uh, little circles and connect them the other way around. That is, I can just um, deform my sphere differently and have two little circles here and then do something like that. So I stretch the sphere and I end up with uh, a torus again. But something is different with that torus. So let us try to keep track what happened to this uh, cycle here. So that's the extension to infinity for the integration cycle we had for the single zeta value. If you're doing that here, then I can trace the yellow line through here. And if I identify zero and infinity, this will make the yellow line being a cycle here around the torus. If I do it the other way around, then I can again trace the cycle through here. So that will be the cycle. And if I connect the two little circles here, the cycle I'm going to get here is exactly that one. And in the genus one world, people are referring to these cycles uh, as the A cycle and that one as the so-called B cycle. And the A cycle and the B cycle will play a role in what I'm going to tell right now. Now, I should uh, again uh, say, or there is a little, one has to be a little cautious here because other people are using the notion of A cycle and B cycle differently, but they are related by a so-called modular transformation and for the physics on this genus one surface, it doesn't make a difference whether you want to call it A cycle or B cycle. And that's just the notion I'm going to choose for what is going to fall. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Is this any interpretation in terms of T duality? Of T duality? Uh, so t-duality, you think about exchanging winding numbers with uh, quantized momentum numbers. Uh, let me think about that. I would guess there is, but I can't make it precise right now. Does anybody else by chance know whether this is related to t-duality, the two ways of actually connecting? The, so one, one should not consider a particular torus, torus compactification, but one should also think about if you compactify uh, or decompactify from a given uh, geometrical situation, whether there are two distinct or different ways, like I pointed out here. I'm pretty sure there is something. So the general t-duality group is the group ODD, and uh, for sure, there is some symmetry which belongs to how you name the A cycle and the B cycle because it's geometrically equivalent. But I can't, can't make it more precise now. Which is exchanging the cycles, yes. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to have a statement saying, oh, we have a symmetry group here and all the different decisions on how to uh, decompactify are related to that group. I, I, can't, I don't know that, unfortunately. Yes? Uh, I, I made a sneaky comment saying that I want to stick with the torus for now uh, because uh, the, if it comes to scattering amplitudes, um, I, I will consider bounded genus one Riemann surfaces. So well, I'll cut the torus in two and have two boundaries. And uh, the klein bottle contribution or for the bounded one, the Möbius contribution, you can for the scattering amplitudes we have been considering and everybody has been considering rather easily by a particular map. So uh, for the scattering amplitudes calculated so far, the uh, half torus is the uh, a sufficient setup. But yes, if it comes to a string theory, you better consider the Möbius strip or the Klein bottle, depending on whether open or not open. So let's start with a little geometry here. Uh, if we want to describe a torus, then this is uh, usually done by cutting the torus open along its two cycles. And what you get if you cut the torus open along the two cycles simultaneously is a parallelogram, basic. So, the parallelogram I want to draw here will be called the fundamental elliptic domain. And I want to identify these two lines and these two lines, which is an expression of the two cycles of the torus. For, furthermore, I would note the length of the two cycles with uh, omega A and omega B and define what will become or what is the modular parameter as omega B or over omega A. In practice, one can always choose uh, omega A to be one, which makes the notion of writing tau here uh, obvious. So tau is the parameter which describes the shape of the torus. And the only object uh, or the only quantity we are interested in is the ratio of the length of these two cycles and the angle between them. So that's more or less a coordinate choice. So the area here will be mapped to the, to the torus. And now, um, let's make that a little more precise. So we are uh, having here the so-called elliptic fundamental domain. And whenever there is a fundamental domain, you have some kind of lattice. And the lattice we are considering is the lattice for the elliptic curve E which is the complex plane divided by the lattice z plus z tau. And one other thing we will need to know is that the tori, uh, I will define them, and that's a useful concept, described by a parameter tau, which is just in the upper half plane. 
So tau should be uh, in the upper half plane. So the H are not the quaternions, but they are, it's the uh, upper half plane. Um, so in particular, tau is not allowed to be real. If it would be real, then the fundamental domain uh, would not be a parallelogram anymore. So we would get two linearly dependent vectors, and we could forget about describing the torus geometry. So that's the notion of, the, uh, of how to describe the torus. And now let us follow exactly the steps I've been doing in thinking about what kind of functions can we integrate iteratively on this genus one surface. So we, uh, the goal is, of course, find an analog for multiple zeta values. And uh, historically, multiple zeta values were defined as the sum representation. Uh, I showed that uh, for the genus one geometry, there is again a very a set of very natural objects which are very very similarly defined to the uh, sum representations of the zeta values. It's just a little different. So let us define the Eisenstein summation convention. So in the same way as there was a sum over a one-dimensional lattice, so the sum over all the natural numbers, we are now going to sum over m and n. Uh, and we'll call that with a little e here for the Eisenstein summation. And then we have some expression or some thing to sum over, which depends on m and n. And this is defined as the limit of uh, n goes to infinity, limit of m goes to infinity, sum of n from minus capital N to capital N, sum of m from minus m to m of a m n. So you want to evaluate that sum uh, on a uh, square and then take the borders of the square to infinity. And if that sum converges, then this is exactly what you mean by writing this Eisenstein sum. Uh, eventually, uh, we'll also have a little tick up here that will be necessary if you define an object where for m and n equal to 0, we get a divergent quantity. That will happen immediately. And now we can define using this convention so called Eisenstein functions. And these Eisenstein functions are defined as Ej of xi and tau. And they are the Eisenstein sum Mn Eisenstein of 1 over psi plus m plus n tau to the power j. That looks very much already like a zeta value. But we can do better and define the Eisenstein series, which is the Eisenstein, or which is a zero of the Eisenstein function. So we define g j of tau, which is the sum m and Eisenstein. And now I need the tick, because I am not allowed to uh, evaluate the following expression, m plus n tau to the power j for m and n equal to 0. Uh, who of you is familiar with Eisenstein series, has dealt with it? Oh, that, that yeah. <laughs> a couple of a couple of people, so that's that's good. So general properties of these uh, functions, so they are very old. That's beautiful 19th century mathematics. Some of it even a little older. Um, 
what can one tell about these uh, set of functions? The first couple of statements are easy to prove, and then there's a lot more which are not so easy to prove. The first is that for j larger and equal to 1, you can show that the derivative with respect to xi of the Eisenstein function xi and tau is precisely minus j times e j plus 1 of xi and tau. And uh, then there is a nice relation to the uh, odd Jacobi theta function. You take the derivative of the logarithm, and, uh, logarithm of tau uh, theta, and this is the odd Jacobi theta function. Uh, then you'll get the Eisenstein function e1 of psi and tau. And furthermore, one can show that uh, the Eisenstein series is zero for all j odd. So we get g2, g4, uh, and so on. g2 is a little special, but uh, it does exist. And we, it is very useful to also define that g0 of tau is equal to g0 is equal to minus 1. So that is a similar statement as saying that uh, finally we want to consider the number 1 as a depth 0 uh, multiple zeta value. At the, in the long run, this will evolve into this uh, condition. Good. Uh, anything which is unclear here? It's just a set of function which is very similar to the uh, zeta values in the sense that you sum over a certain lattice. It's just that you make it two-dimensional by introducing that additional parameter tau. There are other representations which use the two uh, uh, periods, but that's just a, just a scaling. The theta is the odd Jacobi function, so there are four Jacobi functions defined on the elliptic curve. Um, I, I would make a parenthesis around that. So if, if you know about the Jacobi function, that's the relation. We will not very much, uh, we will need it once, once more. So uh, the Jacobi functions, they are somehow a generalization of the sine and cosine functions into two directions. So they are um, almost doubly periodic functions on the elliptic curve, and they actually serve in the same way as sine and cosine uh, of various arguments serve as a complete system of functions which you can expand any reasonably well-behaved function in. Uh, the Jacobi theta functions are the same thing for the elliptic curve. You can expand any elliptic functions in these Jacobi theta functions. So consider it as an uh, elliptic generalization of the sine and cosine, and that's, that's sufficient, I hope, for, uh, for now. Now, uh, for the uh, people which have been already waiting for the Weierstrass p function to show up, let me take the chance and actually write down what the Weierstrass p function or how the relation for the Weierstrass p function is. So uh, who is familiar with Weierstrass p? Some people are. Uh, OK, then let me please write down what uh, the, this function is. So here I will call the two periods w1 and w2. And then the Weierstrass p function is uh, defined again as a lattice sum where I exclude the 0. And then there is 1 over z plus m w1 plus n w2 minus 1 over 
MW1 plus MW2. So uh, that is, one can show, the uh, unique way of generalizing 1 over z squared to something which is periodic on the fundamental domain. There is no other way of doing so. And this function can be written as E2 minus G2 uh, in order to see that one needs to take care for scaling. So if you want to show the identity, assume W1 to be 1, that we can get to the tau variable over there. And then the P prime uh, is the der derivative with respect to the argument Z is minus 2 E3. And this nicely ties in with the uh, well-known fact that the derivative of the Weierstrass p function squared is 4 pi, uh, p cubed minus g2 Weierstrass p minus g3. And these constants, g2, are just 60 g4. That's the Eisenstein series. And this is equal to a 140 g6. So this Weierstrass function uh, is a very weird object. It has amazing uh, properties. In particular, you can show that any doubly periodic or honest doubly periodic elliptic function can be expressed solely in mistake. Or Here it can't. Here, here it can't. Yeah, so I made a tick up here. Yeah, so the prime means that we exclude m equals 0 and n equals 0. Thanks. No, it's the unique uh, extension of 1 over z squared of a function with the pole 1 over z squared to the uh, uh, elliptic curve. And then you can show uh. any, any that would have been my next statement, yes. Any elliptic or doubly periodic function can be expressed as a, a polynomial in the Weierstrass function and its derivative. So, this is somehow, uh, if you want, a basis of functions or something like this. OK, let me wipe the board and then continue. Or maybe this is a good point for having a, the three to five minute break. I will wipe the board and continue in five minutes. So, you want to have something periodic, Say again, please. E1 has only a single pole. E1 has only a single pole because it's an elliptic function. So but I hope I did. No, it's not. No. Exactly. Yeah. I, I will uh, talk about the Kronecker series in a minute and then also make a comment on double honest and not so honest double periodicity. So. Let's, let's continue then in four minutes or something like that. Aber sie waren fröhlich, oder? Die Stimmung war ganz okay. Hm. Ja. Ähm, heißt es denn, dass die Weiher das Bildungsform äh, sowas wie E hoch I X ist? Nein. Ich kann doch auch alle periodischen Funktionen 
Als ja, aber nur mehr in der Jugend Bild schreiben. Das stimmt. Das wäre sozusagen in einer Richtung der Fall. Genau, das meine ich ja. Also die ja, Gehen aber die. Ach so, sowas wie. Ja. Nee, also ja, das stimmt. Das stimmt auf jeden Fall. Also für eine Richtung kannst du alles sozusagen als Wellen ausdrücken oder Foyer expandieren und so weiter. Also Habe ich mich verschrieben? Ja, also das wäre ein Quadrat. Also bei der Weisheitsbeerfunktion sind die Brüche auch ein Quadrat. Uh. Und ähm, Stimmt, man kann ja. die elliptische Funktion aus der rationalen Funktion von P und P Prime nicht als Polynom verstehen. Das kann ich nicht. Ah, das stimmt. Und zwar. Danke. Ja. Denn, denn sozusagen die Potenz kriegt man ja sozusagen hier schon weg ja. durch das Quadrat. Ja, das ist ja auf der elliptischen Kurve, wenn man es also die Branche Kurve schreibt, dann sind es ja auch rationale Funktionen an x und y. Und das y ist dann genau das p prime und das x ist das p. Genau, ja. Also wenn du das ja, ja, ja. Ähm, sagen würdest. Ja, das sage ich auf jeden Fall nochmal.